The scripture says that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So thankful for that reminder in music this morning. Well, next Sunday is Sanctity of Life Sunday. Each year on the Sunday closest to January 22nd, we mark or uh, remember the most unjust, uh, immoral, unconstitutional, deadliest decision the Supreme Court has ever made. The manufactured right to abortion that the Supreme Court created January 22nd of 1973 has cost us 63 million American lives in the last 51 years. 63 million Americans slaughtered. You know, I'm thankful to have witnessed uh, a little over 18 months ago the overturning of that Supreme Court decision. And I'm thankful to live in the most pro-life state in the nation. For the fourth year in a row, Americans United for Life have declared that Arkansas is the number one state in the nation protecting life. Not just the unborn, but the elderly and the infirm and the terminally ill. Well, with the Dobbs decision back in uh, June of 22, you might wonder, why do you still feel the need to speak to the issue? Haven't we won? Well, the Supreme Court returning the decision on abortion to the states was a victory, but that victory, that one victory, does not end the war. Let me, let me just by way of illustration briefly atal, draw your attention to a biblical story that you're very familiar with. In Joshua uh, chapter 9, there's the accounting of the nation of Israel going to war against Jericho. Actually, that was Joshua 6, going to war against Jericho. Jericho was the first city in the land that God had given them to, uh, to conquer and to take. And, and this story speaks to the victory that was achieved and the victory that we've achieved, but it also speaks to the work that's before us. You remember um, Jericho was a fortified city. Uh, even with weapons, the Israelites were going to have great difficulty invading and conquering. But the nation of Israel really had no weapons to speak of. They had no way to uh, be able to go in and conquer this city. And so the battle plan was pretty simple, if not odd. In Joshua 6, it says that God instructed them to march around the city once a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, they were to march around the city seven times. The priests would blow their trumpets and the people would shout. And then, of course, as we know, the walls came down. They went in and conquered the city. But, but think about the story. If you know anything about the Israelites, you know that they were experts at, at whining and complaining. And can you imagine maybe some of the talk during those days of marching, and especially on the seventh day, making seven rounds around the city of Jericho? Can you imagine some of the grumbling? Somebody probably said, this is stupid. Another one probably said, how is this ever going to work? My, my feet are sore. This is exhausting. This is tiring. Probably all those kind of grumblings going on. But on the seventh day, on the seventh lap, because they followed the plan of God, they achieved a great victory. Now, not to be pessimistic here, it was a great victory when the people of Israel conquered uh, the mighty city, the walled city of Jericho. But it was one city in an entire land that God had told them to possess. That one victory did not completely finish all that God had told them to do. There were both victories and defeats ahead, depending on whether they were obedient or disobedient to what God told them to do. But Jericho, as great a victory as it was, was just one victory. We achieved, uh, as a pro-life people, we achieved a great victory in 2022, but it was definitely not the end of the war. It's not over by a long shot. We, we can't sit back and ad admire our trophy, if you will, and not pay attention to the fact that there are going to be some more skirmishes in the future. Arkansas is one of 14 states in our 50 United States. Arkansas is one of 14 states that have completely banned abortion. And according to the Center for Reproductive Rights, there are 11 other states that have declared hostile to abortion. Now, I want to pause right there for just a minute. It seems kind of odd to use the word hostile when we talk about states being against abortion. Am I hostile toward murder? Absolutely, and you should be as well. So 14 states have banned abortion, 11 other states are hostile toward abortion. And with the end of the federal government's overreach last year in that Dobbs decision, it was projected that abortions in the U.S. for this past year, 2023, would only be 700,000. Isn't that great news? 
only 700,000. Now, we haven't seen the final numbers of 2023, but I can tell you in the first six months of 2023, there were 511,000 abortions in the United States. So I'm quite sure we at least hit the projected number of 700,000. 700,000 babies killed last year. You know the leading cause of death worldwide in 2023? Abortion. Worldwide, there were 73 million babies killed by abortion. Now, if you are someone, if you would describe yourself as strongly pro-life, and I think I can describe our church as, as strongly pro-life, we hold a very solid biblical position, uh, not a political position. Uh, this is not a political issue. It's an issue that is used politically as a weapon, but this is a biblical moral issue. And, and if you consider yourself strongly pro-life and if you've invested uh, time and, and resources in the battle, we, we can certainly say that there's reason to celebrate. But what we can't do is we can't be lulled into thinking we've won the war. So why are we still speaking on abortion? Why am I repeating words? You've heard these words from me before. Why am I repeating words that you've heard before from me many times? Because God's word on the issue of abortion needs to be ingrained and written indelibly on our hearts and on our minds because of the culture that we live in. And I hope it's clear that my um, goal today is more than anything to encourage us, to encourage us to stay the course, to encourage us not to, to, to be lulled, uh, not to relax, but to realize that there is much more work to do in the battle for life. Think about the encouragement of Paul to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. He said, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. We, we have won a great victory, but evil still abounds. The evil one is not going to give up. He's not going to discontinue his attempts to destroy the lives of the unborn or their mothers. Let me give you just a little bit of evidence of the increase of evil since the overturn of Roe v. Wade in, in that Dobbs decision. We may have thought that that was a great victory, we could relax, but think of the increase of evil on this issue just since that time. There's been a sharp increase in the arrest and prosecution of people on pro-life side. Uh, people like Chet Gallagher, you remember Chet was with us a couple of years ago here, and, and uh, Chet has been arrested many times. People like uh, Mark Houck, if you don't know the story of Mark Houck, H-O-U-C-K, you should Google it. Mark Houck was a very peaceful uh, pro-life demonstrator. He was arrested at gunpoint by multiple federal agents in his home in front of his seven children and they attempted to prosecute him. The, uh, the state dropped charges against him, but the federal government still attempted to prosecute Mark Howell. There have been over 100 incidents of vandalism and, and threats against crisis pregnancy centers and pro-life organizations, 200 incidences of vandalism against churches, and in all of those, 318 different incidences of threats or vandalism or violence, there have been very few attempts at investigating, and only four people to this point have been prosecuted compared to the hundreds of peaceful, uh, pro-life demonstrators who have been arrested. Soon after the Dobbs decision, a lot of folks don't know this, fortunately it went away very quickly, but soon after the Dobbs decision, there was an attempt uh, within our federal government to codify the right to an abortion in the Constitution and that would nullify all pro-life laws in all states. It wouldn't matter what we had done here in Arkansas and how much progress we had made. Thirdly, in November 22, just a few uh, weeks before the midterm elections, NPR Radio actually aired the audio of a young woman pregnant with twins. They aired the audio of her abortion. Fortunately, that horrible move backfired on them as far as PR goes, but what kind of society have we come to that there is, is that kind of, of loss of basic reverence for life and decency? in our country. And so we see all this increase um, that has happened ever since Roe v. Wade has been overturned. And in Kansas, the closest state to Arkansas where a woman can go and, and get an abortion, the abortion rate has gone up 114%. So this issue has not gone away. The enemy wants us to relax. The enemy wants us to just kind of rest on our laurels and have a false sense of security. But now's not the time. 
even in Arkansas, I mentioned just a few moments ago that Arkansas is the number one state when it comes to, uh, to being pro-life. Even in Arkansas, there's a lot of work to do, a lot of legislative work. In Arkansas, unborn babies do not have equal protection under the law. It's not the same. When a baby is murdered, it's not the same, doesn't even carry the same penalty as when a, a born uh, person is murdered. They don't have equal protection. In Arkansas, women can still obtain abortion pills by mail without the prescription uh, from a doctor. It's a very dangerous practice. It makes it very easy for underage girls to get an abortion without parental consent. And here's something I want to be sure that you're real clear on because it's something that's developing right now within our state. There is a group called Arkansas Ar Arkansans for Limited Government. Arkansans for Limited Government are trying to get a ballot initiative on the ballot during this next election season that would put the right to an abortion in the Arkansas Constitution and would do away with all the good laws that we pass that have uh, diminished abortion in our state. Now, I say that to say to you, you need to be very careful over the next several months as they're trying to get this ballot initiative on the ballot. It's twice uh, been turned down by our Attorney General because of ambiguous language, but you know, ballot initiatives typically are written in such a way that the common person like you and me don't have any idea what they're actually trying to say. So be warned that if you're approached on a, on a parking lot at Kroger, a parking lot at Walmart, if you're approached by someone asking you to sign a petition to get a health care act on the ballot, you shouldn't sign that. This group is trying to get abortion enshrined in our Constitution. If that were to happen, then all of the laws we pass, all the protections that the unborn have in our state would be done away with. So there's legislative work. There's a lot of practical work still to be done. With the overturning of, of Roe v. Wade, a lot of our crisis pregnancy centers and other vital pro-life organizations saw a tremendous drop in financial support. Why? Because people thought, well, hey, we've taken care of that issue, the battle's won. They need our support more than ever. Especially in the state of Arkansas, if abortion remains illegal in Arkansas, which we hope and pray it does, then there are a lot of single moms, a lot of women in, in crisis pregnancies that are going to need our help. So there's a lot of practical work that we have to do in our state as well. And then there's heart work. Not just in Arkansas, but all over our country and all over the world, there's heart work to be done. You know, you really can't legislate morality. And besides that, any legislation that, that we are able to achieve can change when leadership changes. So we've got to do a work, especially as believers, we've got to do a work in changing hearts and minds. And, and that's my purpose today, to exhort us and to encourage us to continue to stand against evil and, and to stand and to speak courageously about what is true. We, we need to spread God's word regarding life and its sanctity. And that's not something you have to spend a lot of time being trained to do. It's really very simple, and I hope you'll see that today. Well, let's remember, let's go to God's Word, uh, the 139th Psalm. If you've got a copy of the Scripture nearby, you may want to turn there, Psalm 139. Let's look at what God's Word says and renew our commitment to what He says about life. Psalm 139, we're going to look just kind of verse by verse at verses 13 through 16. So Psalm 139, look first at verse 13. David is, is speaking to the Lord, and he says, For you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. So the first point we see from God's word this morning is that life, even life in the womb, he's talking about life in the womb, not after a child is born, but pre-born. Life in the womb has value. Life has value because God made us. We were formed, every one of us were formed by the hand of God. I love the terms that David uses here. He says, you, you knit me together. You carefully uh, crafted me. You made the, the inner part of me. You formed my inward parts, the inner part of me that, that no one sees. Every detail, your circulatory system, your, your nervous system, the, the marvels of your mind, those things were all handcrafted by God. And if God made us, if God made that child in the womb, we have no right to destroy the work of his hands. Literally, Scripture tells us, and we'll see another verse in a minute that affirms this, Scripture tells us that every individual human being is a masterpiece made by God. Now, 
you've probably read in the papers recently or heard in the news recently that climate change activists have been going into art galleries and, and trying to ruin masterpieces by uh, Monet and Van Gogh, throwing stuff on those, on those masterpieces, trying to ruin them to make their point. And that's criminal, and it should be criminal. No one should be allowed to go in and try to destroy someone else's masterpiece. And that's just a small picture of what we do when we allow God's masterpiece, a child, to be destroyed in the womb. It's his masterpiece. And he made each one of us uh, carefully forming us in our mother's womb. Now look on in Psalm 139, look at verses 14 and 15. David goes on to say, I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. So in verses 14 and 15, we see that life has value because God's work is perfect. He says, I am fearfully or remarkably and wonderfully made. And that is true of every life. Uh, no life is an accident or a mistake. Now, here's a common argument we hear. Well, what about uh, a child who's deformed or, or handicapped? What about a child that's going to have medical issues? And we know that before they're born, why shouldn't we go ahead and, and abort them or terminate that life because it's going to be a life of hardship? Well, first of all, I'll tell you this, only 3% of abortions are for reasons that it was thought the child would be handicapped or deformed in some way. Even more shocking than that, reports have shown that of all eugenic abortions that were prescribed on the basis of genetic testing, genetic testing was done, the doctor came to the couple and, and recommended based on that testing that they abort uh, that child, the genetic testing was wrong one half to three quarters of the time. What that means is if children were aborted on the basis of genetic testing, more children who were not handicapped or deformed were destroyed than children who might have been handicapped or deformed. We can't trust genetic testing, and even if that genetic testing was 100% accurate, God made that child in the womb. God made each of us so our lives would have the impact that he wants to have. I think in, in uh, John 9 where the disciples encountered a, a man born blind and they asked Jesus, well, who sinned? Did this man sin or did his parents sin? Why, why is he being punished uh, by blindness? And Jesus said, well, that, that's not it. It's not he's being punished by blindness because of his sin or his parents' sin. He said, this man was born blind that the work of God might be displayed. In other words, God is going to work through this blind man's life to bring glory to God himself. Listen, handicaps, and any parent of a handicapped child will tell you, a handicap does not change the value of a person's life, and a handicap certainly does not merit the death penalty. Think about this, if we're gonna kill an unborn child because he or she might be handicapped, what about the child that is born with a handicap that went undetected? Then what? You know, former Virginia Governor Ralph Northern had a, had a solution for that. He actually suggested that in Virginia that the law be that a woman can give birth to a child if that child is born and there's something wrong or some undetected handicap, they could set that child off to the side and, and give that child some comfort care while the parents decided whether or not they wanted that child to live. So that's the solution. If a child's born with a handicap that's undetected, why not kill it after birth? Listen, if handicap merits the death penalty, what about someone who later in life has an accident? Someone who later in life has a debilitating illness? What do we do with them? You don't have to look far for that solution. Look to our neighbor to the north. See how Canada has greatly expanded their euthanasia laws. It's a slippery slope when we let the basis for life be whether or not someone is, has a handicap or a deformity. God told Moses when Moses complained that he wasn't a good speaker in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 11, God said to Moses, well, who made your mouth? Who made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? In other words, God is saying, that's the way I made that person. And that person is still his masterpiece. 
In Ephesians 2.10 is where we get the word for masterpiece. It says we are God's, the Greek word is poema, his masterpiece. He created us skillfully, he created us artfully, so we have no right to destroy what he has made. Well, as you know, another big argument for abortion is the issue of rape or incest. What about a child that's conceived by rape or incest? Well, typically, we hear numbers that rape or incest cases are about 1% to 3% of all abortions. But interestingly, in 2022, the CDC, and they keep numbers on abortion, the CDC released some statistics that show that cases of rape represented less than half of 1% of all abortions. In the state of Arkansas in 2022, the report that's done here, it's called the Induced Abortion Report. Of the 1,657 abortions in the state of Arkansas in 2022, one was because of a case of rape or incest. Now, not only is it a very small number, but let's take even that small number. We have to ask the questions. The question, when did we decide to condemn the innocent for the crime of someone else? Abortion doesn't bring healing to the young woman, doesn't bring healing to the victim. That's been proven time and, and time again. And why would we punish the unborn child for a crime committed by someone else when that, that child is innocent? What am I saying this morning? I'm saying that a, a child is a child, a human is a human, regardless of the circumstances of conception. The circumstances of conception don't make any difference at all. Now, life has value, we've seen in Psalm 139, first of all, because it was made by God. Secondly, because every life or every work of God, every life created is perfect. Now look at verse 16, the, the final verse we're gonna look at this morning in Psalm 139. David says, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Well, verse 16 tells us life has value because God has plans for every life. David said, before I was even born, you had numbered my days and you had set aside the works that you wanted me to do. You know, God had plans for your life before you were even conceived. He knew everything that you could be and everything that you would be. He knew exactly how many days you would live and the opportunities you would have. Your life was part of his plan for the world. And God, according to Psalm 139, 16, God has an individual plan for the life of every child, and that plan is in place even before conception and birth. You know, you have to stop and think and, and ponder the 63 million Americans who were killed in the last 51 years. You have to wonder about God's plans and purposes for their life. You have to wonder what might be different in our country and in our world if all of those lives had been lived out and how radically different um, our world might be with those lives. It's been said recently by some in our government as we think about the uh, immigration issue and the border issue. By the way, I'll just go ahead and say this message is not about immigration, but I am 100% pro legal immigration. And just like most legal immigrants, I have a lot of issues with illegal immigration. But you know that some in our government have said, we need open borders because we don't have enough Americans to fill all the jobs that are open. Isn't that interesting? We need open borders because we don't have enough people to fill the jobs. And yet over the last 51 years, we've aborted 63 million people who would now be uh, in the job market. Let's go even a step further. Very recently, Chuck Schumer claimed, he was talking about the declining birth rate in America. And he claimed that the solution to the declining birth rate was to grant a path to citizenship for 11 million illegal immigrants currently living in the country. And Chuck Schumer is part of a group that advocates abortion uh, for any reason at any time up to and including the moment of birth. Now, hear me clearly, I'm not, I'm not being partisan here. The pro-life issue is not a partisan issue. Yes, it's used in politics. There are Republicans and Democrats who are pro-life. There are pro Republicans and Democrats who are pro-death. It's not a partisan issue. But some of the logic and reasoning we're hearing needs to wake us up to realize how illogical 
the whole issue of abortion has become. And for us in the church, we have to continue to speak up and to focus on the truth. And that starts with scripture and that starts with us as the church. We're the ones that have to speak the truth. We're the ones that have to say, no, life belongs to God. He is the only one who has any right to, to give life or take life. God's word clearly says that life begins in the womb. At that moment, he forms a, a distinct human being, not a blob of tissue. And all life, no matter how it comes about, no matter if it's life that is deficient mentally or physically, all life is valuable. God's made that very clear in his word. Let me just give you a few references here. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. What does God think about the taking of life? Exodus 20, 13, you shall not murder. Deuteronomy 32, 39, see now that even I am he, and there is no God beside me, I kill, and I make alive, I wound, and I heal. Job 12.10, in his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Proverbs chapter 6, Solomon lists in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, six things that the Lord hates. And the third item on the list is hands that shed innocent blood. You see, what we've done in the church is we have allowed uh, godless voices in our society, godless voices in our government and in media to, to confuse us and even deceive us. And so in the church, even when we know the truth, we've been silenced and we're afraid to speak into a culture of lies. Can I tell you, this is gonna sound really blunt and harsh, but can I tell you that we have helped propagate the lies that are being distributed in our culture. We've helped propagate the deception around a culture of death because we've not spoken up. So church, we need to speak up. The, the battle's not done and we need to speak up. I, I wanna share this morning very quickly two of the most prevalent lies that you'll hear from people who believe that abortion is a, is a fundamental right. There are a lot of lies and deception out there, but there are two that are very prevalent. And I don't wanna say this, you don't have to get in a big debate or a big argument with someone, but I hope that you'll prepare yourself to be able to speak very simply a truthful answer. Lie number one, it's not taking a life. We're not sure, this is not me speaking, this is those who are in favor of killing the unborn. We're not sure when human life begins. Okay, well then let's ask the question, when does life begin? You know, there are a lot of surveys that have been done where surveyors have gone out and asked people this question. Is it always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being? And when people are asked that question, is it always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being, whether or not they are strong proponents of abortion, even those who believe that abortion is a right, they still respond, yes, it is always wrong to kill an innocent human being. So, so then how has the abortion of a human being become acceptable? It's become acceptable with the declaration that the baby isn't a baby, that the baby isn't a human. That's why those on the side of abortion say it's not the taking of a life. Joseph Goebbels, who was the propaganda, propaganda minister of the Nazi party in the 1930s declared this, a lie told once remains a lie, but a lie told a thousand times becomes the truth. So here's what's happened. Planned Parenthood and other pro-abortion groups have replaced the truth with a lie. They have said to our culture, it's not a baby, it's not a human, it's not a life, it's a fetus, it's an embryo, it's a product of conception, it's just tissue. Now here's what's interesting about those declarations they're just rhetoric. They offer no evidence. Have you ever seen someone trying to prove that it's not a baby in the womb? We have all kinds of evidence that it is a baby in the womb. They've never tried to prove. They just offered the rhetoric and they've repeated it so often it's become acceptable truth. It's not a baby. It's just tissue. Well, how about we do this? Here's a popular term we've heard in recent years. Let's follow the science. What, is the, what does the science say? The vast majority of medical experts concede and agree that life begins at conception. California Medical Society in the early 1970s had this statement written in their documentation, the cell formed by the union of an ovum and sperm represents the beginning of a human being. 
fertilization is a critical landmark because a new genetically distinct human organism is thereby formed. They didn't say it was tissue, lifeless tissue. They didn't say it was an appendage of the mother. They said it was a distinct human organism. Professor Jaime Gordon of the Mayo Clinic. By all the criteria of modern molecular biology, life is present from the moment of conception. Professor Micheline Matthews Roth, Roth, Harvard Medical School. It is incorrect to say that biological data cannot be decisive. It is scientifically correct to say that an individual human life begins at conception. And then Dr. Jerome Lejeune. Dr. Lejeune is a professor of genetics. He's considered the father of modern genetics. He said, after fertilization has taken place, a new human being has come into being. Each individual has a very clear beginning at conception. It is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. It's just plain experimental evidence. 95% of biologists, including them, those who consider themselves liberal, 95% of biologists, even including some who are pro-abortion, agree that life begins at conception. And so genetically and medically, at the moment of conception, science tells us you have a human being with his or her own genetic code. And so the only difference in what you have at the moment of conception and at the moment of birth, the only difference is a change in size and location. At the moment of conception, you have a human being and a human being's nature does not change from the moment of conception to the moment of birth. Well, here's the second most prevalent lie that we hear today, and that is this, okay, let's say it's a baby. Every woman should have the right to choose. What about a woman's rights? Well, let's talk about the right to choose in our nation. The right to choose is not unlimited. I'll give you a couple of examples. Second Amendment says that you have the right to own a firearm, but you do not have the right to fire that firearm anywhere you want to. We have in our country um, the ability to get a license to own a car and you have the right to choose where you will drive your car. But that right to choose where you will drive is limited so you can't drive over other people's property. You, you can't drive your car through a, a park or in spaces that are designated for pedestrians. The right to choose is always limited by its effect on others. And we have thousands of free choices that are available to us because those choices don't harm other people. But there are choices that are prohibited because they bring harm to others. We can't choose to murder and rape and steal and abuse, especially children. We can't choose to do those things. Those things are illegal because they bring harm to another person. We oppose the things that we call evil, we oppose these evils, not because we're opposing a right, we're opposing a wrong. We're not opposing a woman's right to choose, we're opposing the wrong of killing a human being. Well, but every woman has a right to control her body. Well, in civilized society, our, our um, right to bodily control is not an absolute unlimited right. You, there are things that you cannot do that you're legally not allowed to do with your body because they're not, they're not right legally or morally. And so they're prohibited. So the key question when you talk about a, a woman's right to her body, anyone's right to their body, the key question is, does what you do with your body bring harm to someone else? D does your right cause another person to be victimized? Well, what about a woman's reproductive rights? We're not opposed to a woman's reproductive rights. We're fine with that. We oppose the killing of an unborn child after reproduction has occurred. You know, the big buzzword most recently on the side of abortion is reproductive justice. What about reproductive justice? And the question would be justice for whom? Who's receiving justice when we allow abortion? I guess when you talk about matters of reproductive justice because the baby cannot speak for himself or speak for herself, then they don't get justice. Reproductive justice is allowing a baby 
who has been conceived to be born and to be raised with the unalienable right given by our Creator, and that is the right to life. Well, now you know there are some women that, that, that they, they're young, they shouldn't have gotten pregnant, they're still in school, they, they don't have the finances. What about an unwanted pregnancy? Well, since when does anyone's right to live depend on someone wanting them? There are many uh, adoptive couples that I know, many in our church, that are blessed to have a child that was a product of an unwanted pregnancy, that the mother couldn't raise, that the mother wasn't equipped to handle. A child was not unwanted. No child is unwanted. And should any civilized nation give to any human the right to kill another human in order to solve the first human's problem. That's not civilization. Well, I said two prevalent lies and I've covered those, but I've got to take just another minute because there is one other lie that is often spoken around this issue. And I, and I have to say something about it because it's typically spoken by people who are supposedly conservative, people who are opposed to abortion, even by people who are believers. And, and here's that lie. I've heard people say this, well, I'm personally against abortion, but women should have a choice, and besides that, it's the law of the land. Let me tell you something. I don't care what the law of the land is. If the law of the land is against God's law and violates God's commands, we do not have to obey it. It doesn't matter that it's the law of the land when it violates the, the word of God. But, but more than that, it's, it, if that's where you stand, I, I'm against abortion, but women should have a choice, it's the law of the land. Can I tell you, it's completely illogical to say, I'm for life, I'm against abortion, I'm for life, but I'm also for choice. That's an absolutely illogical argument. There's only one reason that a person can be against abortion, and that is because they believe abortion is the taking of a human life, it's the, the killing of a child. If you believe that that's what abortion is, then you can't be in favor of another person's right. You can't defend their right to kill if you believe killing is wrong. So you can't be pro-life for yourself, but pro-choice for everyone else. You know, 160 years ago in our nation, a, a war was fought over slavery. And if you were anti-slavery, you believed it was not only wrong for you to own a slave, you believed it was wrong for anyone to own slaves. If you didn't believe it was wrong for everyone to own slaves, then you weren't anti-slavery, you were pro-slavery. You, you can't have it both ways. If you don't believe abortion is wrong for everyone, then you're not truly pro-life. It's either wrong or it's not. So what do we do? Where do we find ourselves now? Roe v. Wade's been overturned. The decisions have been returned to the states. Some states have already uh, codified abortion in their constitution. Some states are still faced with that battle, just like we are in the state of Arkansas. If we're truly pro-life, let me just suggest several things. One is we need to speak and act as if we're pro-life. We don't need to be silent about this issue. We, we can't claim something and then do nothing. We can't claim to be pro-life and then do nothing to demonstrate that we're truly pro-life. Children, all children matter to God. If they matter to God, they better matter to us. And pro-life is not just something we say. Pro-life is pro-action. Let me just say one real simple thing. Next Sunday is the March for Life, two o'clock, state capitol. We're still gonna to continue to march for life even though currently abortion is illegal in the state of Arkansas because there's much more to be done. But you need to find ways, if you're truly pro-life, you need to find ways, opportunities to get involved and there are many that are there. You need to pray and, and keep on praying. You need to know the truth, you need to speak the truth. Our, our battle uh, here, our battle has been won or one battle has been won, but just like in any war, the enemy is gonna double down. The enemy's gonna come back even harder and even stronger and, and strike back more viciously. We, we can't let up. We have to continue to stand for what's right and what's firm. We have to continue to speak uh, consistently and lovingly and, and courageously. We have to speak truth into a culture of lies that you and I live in today. 
And let me, let me say this very clearly too. Our, our reason, our purpose in speaking against abortion, our purpose in standing against abortion is not to condemn anyone. I recognize that there are people with, within our church, this is within every church, there are Christians who in the past have made some mistakes. There are women in our churches who have had abortion. There are men who have encouraged their wives or girlfriends to have an abortion. Our purpose is not to condemn, our purpose is to prevent and to change the culture. And I wanna say this to you this morning, if you're, if you're a mom who has had an abortion, I want you to know that your unborn child your baby, every single baby that has been aborted, the 63 million American children that have been aborted have received, have been a recipient of God's grace, and today your baby is in heaven with a loving father who has even given your baby a name. And, and you need to receive that grace. And I wanna to say to you this morning, if you're someone who has had an abortion or had any part in someone having an abortion and, and you're still suffering the woundedness from that, there is help available. And I know you won't call the church, I get that. Let me just refer you to one organization, Deeper Still Arkansas. If you need help, Deeper Still Arkansas is the place to go. They're very confidential. We'll never know about it, but they will offer you the help that you need. You know, this morning, as we remember that all life is precious to God, I wanna remind every single one of us, me, you, everyone hearing this message today, that your life is so valuable to him that he gave the life of his son. Jesus came and died to forgive your sin, to take your punishment, to take my punishment for sin, and to give us the gift of life, eternal life. That's the gospel. And the gospel is the most pro-life message ever. It's a message of grace, that God's grace is available to anyone who will receive it. Would you bow with me this morning? Father, thank you for truth. Sometimes truth is hard. Sometimes it's hard to accept. But God, we want to be people who live on your truth. And Father, in a culture that is filled with deceit and lies, help us to stand firm and help us to speak up courageously lovingly, with grace, but help us to speak up. Father, I pray if there's someone this morning who's heard the truth from your word and recognizes that they don't have a relationship with you, I pray that they would recognize how valuable their life is to you and how much you want a relationship with them. Father, I pray for us as a church that we would continue to be the lighthouse you've called us to be. We'd continue to stand firm on truth and continue to speak your grace into a culture in need. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.